Hi folks, I don't look my best at the moment. I had to come down to our office, my office here in Decatur. Um, this is the office warehouse space that we originally used for our church here in Alabama. As soon as we arrived, I had to get our uh, online ministry back up and running as quickly as I could because we have um, a pretty extensive online following and I did not want to uh, not be offering our services at least online as quickly as possible once we got here. The move and, and the whole um, relocation wound up costing us, I think, two, two or three Sundays. And so uh, I was trying to do everything in my power to get our services back up and running as quickly as we could. Uh, we don't have space in our new house like we did in our house in Dallas to set up a studio or, or a sanctuary space. So I had to find something I could rent and set up. And this office warehouse space is really, it really worked out well, except for the fact that um, the warehouse where we set up our sanctuary during the cooler months, it was perfect. It worked beautifully. But when the weather started getting hot and humid here in Alabama, we brought in some portable air conditioners and they wound up being awful loud. And uh, you could hear them on the video. And, uh, you know, and I didn't want that because I like our video quality to be the best that it possibly can be. So long story short, uh, finally I was able to find a space down in Huntsville, which is where we really wanted to be from the word go, but I couldn't find anything initially in Huntsville. So this space is about a mile, a mile and a half from our house. Uh, the church has a lot of stuff stored, storage, in storage. And it was in Dallas. We actually had two 10 by 20 spaces in Dallas, and they were packed. We have stuff going back to when our ministry in Dallas had uh, an outreach center, which is a Christian bookstore complete with a coffee shop. And also when our church in Dallas at one time, uh, or actually on about two or three different occasions, we ran a thrift shop for a period of time. So we have all kinds of fixtures and product and all kinds of stuff. Um, tomorrow I could go in and set up a new outreach center or a thrift shop. And we have, you know, pretty much everything we need to set those things up. Plus, we have all kinds of church-related things. We could buy a church building tomorrow, and we would have everything we need to set up offices, a Sunday school program, you name it. We've got the stuff to do it. So anyway, this space now, now that we're in, now that we're having our church space in Huntsville on Memorial Parkway, um, this space here close to the house, I'm using as an office. <coughs> the office here I'll be using as an office. And then we brought all our stuff up from storage in Dallas, and it's now stored in the warehouse next to me, you know, accessible through the office as well. So anyway, as I mentioned in my Facebook post earlier, tomorrow's my 58th birthday, it's hard to believe. And as I was here cleaning my office space today, it with these fixtures behind me, my shelves and stuff, man, they were dusty and filthy and 
They'd been in storage for a good while, and my desk had been in storage, and it was dirty, and everything needed to be cleaned. I tried to hire a guy who was supposed to come in Friday and clean for me because I was hoping I could hire somebody to do this. He never showed. So today I came out and just started cleaning and trying to get things organized by myself. But in the process of going through stuff in storage to see what I wanted to bring here into the office, um, I fell across some things and I said, wow, I'm telling you, talk about memory lane. Folks, my life has been about ministry since I was a kid, literally. I was a very precocious um, young person. I was very big for my age. I was full height, about 5'10", 5 5'11", 5 by the time I was 12. And people always thought I was much older than I really was because I was old acting. You know, anybody who knows my story knows I grew up in a, in a really ridiculous environment with a father who was a pathological narcissist. Uh, I mean, he makes Donald Trump look like Bozo the Clown very destructive, very nasty, very hateful, very just not good. And when you grow up in an environment like that, I think I think it tends to kind of force kids to have to grow up real, real fast. So I was always much older acting than I actually was. And when I was 12 years old, I actually felt led to start a children's ministry. I knew I wasn't old enough to preach to adults, you know, but I, I knew I could minister to children my own age or younger, you know, and I started a clown ministry of all things. And um, his name was Jiggle, capital J, small I, capital G, dash, capital G, small I, small L, Jiggle. And it stands for Jesus is God and God is love. And as I'm going through my stuff today here at the office, I found a couple of things I might share with you all just, just for kicks, okay? So I'm going to turn my camera around so I can share ooh, a couple of items on my desk with you. This is one of the earliest pictures that was ever taken of me as I was um, formulating the character of Jiggle. Uh, I went on to eventually hire a seamstress, a professional seamstress. She came in and she made a beautiful costume for Jiggle that I wore. And in the uh, belt line of the costume, I actually could feed through a hula hoop that she cut. And then that way you could feed it through a, uh, a pocket in the waistline of the costume. And that gave me a big round center that kind of floated around. Unfortunately, back then, if you took pictures, everything had to be on film. So you had to um, take regular pictures, have them developed, you know, so on and so forth. Well, I was only 12 and I didn't necessarily have all the money in the world. So I didn't get a whole lot of pictures of my ministry at that time, which really breaks my heart. I wished I had of, but the little boy in the blue uh, on my right knee is my baby brother. And then some of the other children around me were from the church I grew up in. But that was my initial foray into ministry. I started as a children's evangelist. I did that uh, for four years. I was simultaneously appointed by my pastor at the age of 12 to be our children's church director in our local church. Then 
come over here. This is the original newspaper clipping of an article that appeared in the New York Daily News. Um, I can't see the date on it. I want to say, I think it was around 19, either 1996 or 97 or so. Charles W. Bell, who was the religion editor for the New York Daily News, called me, said that he had heard about our ministry and wanted to know if he could write an article about us. I was ministering at that time in New York City, which is where I lived for the entire decade of the 90s. And he said, when I heard gay and Pentecostal in the same sentence, he said, I knew that I had to do an article about you. Uh, I went through a lengthy interview with him. To be honest, he got a lot of the facts wrong in the article. The, the timeline and the way that he put things together in the article were not entirely accurate. Um, but I also gave him some tapes of our sermons to listen to. And he's the one who came up with the headline, He's Gay Shepherd with Old Time Fire. And uh, that was Charles W. Bell's idea. <laughs> and uh, I came out to the world at that point, and I knew that when I did this, that any hopes of ministering in mainstream circles was out the window. I'd never again, really, after this article came out, I would never again be able to minister in mainstream churches. I had preached in dozens and dozens and dozens of mainstream churches in New York and Connecticut and New Jersey and Pennsylvania, uh, all over that area. Um, when I first started my entry into affirming ministry, and the reason for that was I had no clue what I was doing. <laughs> I didn't know what to do or how to do it. So, um, my former partner and I opened up a outreach center in Brooklyn, like I was describing earlier, that we had opened in Dallas. It had a Christian bookstore with a library. Back then, we didn't have the internet, so we actually had a library where you could borrow materials. It had an extensive um, area where you could use reference materials in-house. We had a library style copier, so if a, a lot of preachers would come in and use our library, and then they could literally photocopy pages out of the uh, um, biblical um, encyclopedias and dictionaries and atlases and the other uh, reference materials that we had. We were, I was doing a lot of writing and a lot of studying during that time, trying to lay the groundwork for my affirming ministry. But because Jason and I had opened up this learning center, we wound up with a lot of preachers coming into the center. And long story short, I begin to get a lot of invitations to preach in mainstream uh, churches. And I would preach in those churches. We would have wonderful, wonderful services. I was getting all kinds of referrals. Next thing you know, every Sunday and every Wednesday and many Thursdays and other days, I was uh, booked up to preach all over the southern New England area. But this article ended all that. When I allowed the Daily News to do this article, I knew that uh, I was closing the door to all my former mainstream ministry connections. Then, as I'm setting up my office today, I came across this. And this, of course, is my certificate of ordination. I was ordained on September the 18th, 
1994, so exactly 29 years ago today. It was a Sunday, and uh, I'll go back to letting you all see my pretty face. It was a Sunday, and my former partner and I were had left New York City and we briefly went to Pennsylvania. Uh, I had an aunt there by marriage who pretty much begged me, oh, I wish you'd come start a work here. I'll support you, I'll be there, I'll help you. And uh, so we wanted to get out of New York. While I was out of church, I had done a lot of, honestly, a lot of nasty things to be frank and honest. And I wasn't proud of them. And every time I would walk down the street in New York City, I was walking past places I used to frequent. Um, and I'm not just talking about clubs and bars. I'm, I'm talking about some pretty nasty places. And so I really kind of wanted to put New York behind me, you know. So Jason and I decided we'd go to Pennsylvania we rented a VFW hall. We began to have church services there. Um, again, this is when I was trying to, to get my foot into a firming ministry. We actually had a couple of LGBT people that came, and um, but we had a lot of straight people that came. And I mean, we had older folks, we had younger folks, we, we had several people that really loved our ministry and loved our church. Jason and I became friendly with the pastor of a mainstream apostolic Pentecostal church who lived about maybe 40 minutes from where we were. And we became very friendly with him and we would go visit with him and spend time with him and stuff. And I was very upfront with him and I told him what we were trying to do and about my relationship with Jason and everything. And long story short, uh, he actually came with some of his folks and visited our church in uh, Pennsylvania a few times. And we'd have wonderful fellowship meetings. His church was independent, non-denominational, and they were set up to ordain ministers. And he came to me one day and he said, Brother Charles, um, would you allow me to ordain you? He said, you know, your ministry is not associated with any de denomination or any group. And he said, in some states, you can't perform weddings or you can't do certain things unless you have a certificate on the wall saying that your peers in some fashion or another have recognized your calling and recognized your ministry and ordained you. And he said, I would count it an honor if you'd allow me to ordain you. And he even told me, he said, I don't want any dues from you. I don't want anything. I just want to be able to do this for you. So I told him at that time, the ministry that I had structured, Grace Oasis Ministries is the name that we adopted when I first, first, first started my affirming ministry. Uh, we adopted the name Grace Oasis Ministries. And uh, I told him, I said, well, Grace Oasis Ministries is set up to ordain. The only problem is we, the way I drew up the bylaws and everything, we would have uh, in the local church, you have a pastoral board made up of pastoral uh, counselors. And, but at a ministry level, we, we wanted to have what we called an executive board or executive counselors. And I said, according to the bylaws that I established, um, we need my signature as the overseer and we need two executive uh, counselors to sign off on an ordination. So he and one of the men in his church volunteered to serve as executive counselors to our ministry. 
He then ordained me through his ministry. And then according to the bylaws of our ministry, I was able to slide, you might say, the ordination over so that my ordination would be under the auspices of our own ministry, Grace Oasis Ministries. So the certificate that I showed you um, reflects that I'm ordained through Grace Oasis Ministries. But initially, I was ordained by this man and his ministry. And then we we just slipped, you know, slipped it over to Grace Oasis Ministries. And there was a reason I did that, because uh, according to the bylaws of any organization, um, they can defrock you or they can take away your ordination if your life ever uh, manifests behaviors or conduct, whatever, that they don't approve of. Well, he was keeping it on the down low. He knew what Jason and I were and what we were doing. You know what I'm saying? But he wasn't advertising that. And I didn't want it to happen that one day somebody would find out and they would demand that he withdraw my ordination, you know. So in order to protect it ongoing, we transferred it over to Grace Oasis. Um, anyway, that, you know, it's amazing when you're in this kind of ministry, the lengths you have to go to. It's really sad. You know, I've had people in recent days contact me and ask if it wouldn't be possible for them to remain off camera when we do our services because we share our services online and we broadcast them or what have you. And I explained to them, when we have people in church, um, we always explain to them where you sit so you're not gonna be on camera and people who don't care, you know, will go ahead and be on camera. But for the most part, if you don't want to be on camera, we make sure you're not, you know, so that's not a problem. Uh, but, you know, in most churches, this wouldn't even be a concern. But in an affirming environment, there are things that you have to think about. There are issues you have to deal with that you never have to deal with, you know, in a mainstream church. <sighs> anyway, I'm kind of worn out. I've got this space cleaned up a little bit. I still have floors to mop and what have you, but I'm going to have to do that another day. But as I was going through everything and I found my ordination certificate, I found the copy of the original Daily News article, and I found that picture of my early jiggle days just really stirred up a lot of memories. My whole life, I've been loving the Lord, serving the Lord since I was a kid. I grew up in a small Pentecostal church in southern New England. My faith has been and always will be the most important thing in the world to me. And I have had a burden for 30 years to help LGBT people rediscover uh, and reconcile their faith in God. I went through a terrible, terrible fight myself. For a number of years, I was out of church and I just could not reconcile being gay with being Christian. Took the Lord really slapping me in the head to get my attention till uh, he finally was able to convince me that I needed to look at these issues again. And I needed to look at them more studiously, more carefully. And uh, in 1993, I did. And I began to look into them much more carefully, much more studiously. I began to research, going back into the Greek, the Hebrew, the Chaldee, I began to literally research Hebrew teaching on some of the subjects and on some of the passages that are commonly used to abuse LGBT people. And my eyes were open. I, I couldn't believe what I learned. I couldn't believe what I found. Um, I came into a whole brand new 
understanding of the grace of God and how the grace of God works in the life of a believer and how um, it is there not to perfect us. Grace is not proactive that way. Grace does not do that sort of thing. That's not what grace is. Grace is there because it is impossible for us to be perfect. The law of Moses demanded perfection. Jesus came so that the demand for perfection no longer was necessary. By faith, through grace, we become partakers of the perfection, the righteousness, the holiness of Jesus Christ himself. The word of God says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Just because you're baptized into the body of Christ, you don't suddenly become perfect or sinless. You don't suddenly become incapable of, of doing wrong or, or sinning. But the righteousness of Christ becomes our cloak. And all God asks of us, all he demands of us, is that we endure and hold fast to our faith. And the thing that LGBT people allow to be pulled away from them, the thing that they allow to be robbed from them because of false teaching in many churches and because of attitudes and uh, spirits that are wicked and wrong, condemnatory and nasty, the thing they allow to be robbed from them is their faith, the very thing that can save you. And the answer to that is, you have got to rediscover your faith. You've got to have a new encounter with Jesus Christ. And when you understand this gospel, the way this gospel was written, the way this gospel was meant to be preached. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. You will never, ever, ever again allow anybody to assault your faith. You'll look at them and say, you know what, think what you want to think, honey. You don't bother me no kind of way. When people come at me, you can't be a Christian because, you know, and they do it every day. Trust me. Um, I look at them and say, you know what, sweetie, you just keep walking in your legalistic, condemnatory ignorance. You just have a party in it all you want to. I know better, okay? So I don't want none of that. I'm not interested in, you know, their attitudes don't affect me. Their, their spirit doesn't bother me no kind of way because I know the truth of God's word. And in the end, we're going to be saved by grace through faith. And they ain't nobody, nobody going to take my faith. All right, folks, I've talked enough. I didn't mean to preach at you. That just kind of came out. So we'll call that a freebie today, okay? I'm trying to get my office organized here in Decatur because I'm thinking about maybe coming. I don't know if I'll be able to do it every day, but I'm going to try to do it as regularly as I can. I'm thinking about coming to my office and doing little um vignettes like this, you know, little devotionals like I'm doing right now. And uh, so if I can just get this office all cleaned up and organized, uh, it'll look nice, it'll feel good. And then I'm, I'm going to start trying to do some of these podcasts. So y'all keep me in prayer. If the Lord wills and I wake up tomorrow morning, I'm going to be 58 years young. And uh, it's been a struggle, I'm going to tell you, it's been a struggle. There hasn't 
been one minute of this affirming ministry that has been easy. I haven't been able to find support. I haven't been able to find help. Um, everything winds up falling on myself and Tommy. And uh, it's not easy, but by the help and grace of God, we're going to keep plugging. I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I'm going to do what you called me to do until you come or until I die one. That's the deal. All right, folks, I appreciate your taking a little while to listen to my rantings. God bless you. In Jesus' name is my prayer.